now we're going to be painting a copper kettle which can be kind of tricky so I like to mix my colors first to make myself a little chart so it's kind of helpful I'm not second guessing as I'm going along and I also like to make a black and white image so that I can see where the highlights and the reflections are much more easily and I have used masking fluid to mask out the really bright highlights and I'm going to wet the main body of the kettle before I put on the lightest washes to begin. I'm going to start with Azo Yellow. It can also be called Oreolin and if you don't have Azo Yellow you can use Winsy Yellow, you can use Camium Yellow, even Lemon Yellow. This is quite a, a sharp cool yellow and I'm also mixing raw sienna with permanent rose to make a pink, very pinky tone and I love quinacridone gold. I've also mixed that with permanent rose for a more goldish intense pinky tone. Copper has a lot of pink and throughout this painting I have used permanent rose in most of the mixes, all of the browns, even the dark cool mixes I've added some permanent rose. I've also used vermilion and cadmium red and any time I've mixed a brown I've usually put cadmium red and permanent rose in the mix. I'm working on the underwash on the spout and while this is wet I'm working some wet in wet and put some cadmium red. There were some really bright red reflections in this kettle. I photographed it in an antique store I found few beautiful copper kettles in there and a lovely copper pot and I thought it would be a very interesting subject to try and paint. Difficult too. Now the little handle at the top of the lid and the the handle of the kettle were made of brass so I'm using a, a more yellowy raw sienna for uh, the background of those or you could use quinacridone gold and then I need that layer to be dry before I can work on the second layer. And while I was waiting for it to dry, I put some of those copper colors on the tabletop and some cerulean blue. And later, off camera, I put very, very light wash of cerulean blue around the kettle. With touches, I believe I put touches of hooker's green in there too, so that the green will be a complement to the reds I've used and the blue a complement to the orangey browns. Now I want some soft highlights on the lid and some hard highlights. So I wet a little area there to make those highlights lovely and soft. And then as I get over to the other side, I'm working on dry paper and those highlights will be much harder. And with the burnt sienna, I've mixed in the permanent rose and the a little bit of cadmium red, sometimes a, a touch of vermilion to, like I say, make some pink pinkish reddish browns and I'm using my thirsty brush to suck up a little of the color want it lighter I keep keep life you can see sometimes in my hand my reference photo I keep looking at it making sure that I'm really really studying where all the changes are in the reflections the light browns and the dark browns and the pinky browns there are way more color transitions than you think when you study the the photo carefully or if you're very lucky and you've got a copper pot in front of you you can study it firsthand. Now I've made a, a much darker brown mix with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and still a touch of the permanent rose and cadmium red to put in the little dark details and these will be darkened up more later. They, they look fairly dark right now but when they dry they, they will lighten up considerably. So I've added some Indian red and transparent iron oxide to my cadmium red and permanent rose, making a very reddish brown. Indian red is, is almost a purplish, purplish reddish brown. I don't use it very often. It's quite opaque and I, I prefer the transparent colors, but for these copper colors, it just seemed perfect. And the transparent iron oxide, it's a Daniel Smith paint, very beautiful. There's some very um, hard highlights on that side of the kettle. And then they transition into much softer, lighter 
colors. So in a moment, you'll see I'm, I'm spreading that paint with a wet brush so that I can soften up the highlights. A little, little bit of quinacridone gold and burnt sienna and going into a lighter pinky tone. And when I finish this layer, I put on more masking fluid to mask out some of the mid-tone reflections. Not all of the reflections were white. They were, they were the, the lighter browns and the lighter pinks. And sometimes I just like to work carefully with the brush too, which is pretty tricky when I'm filming. The tripod is, is right in the way of where I would like to be sitting and painting, so I can't get quite close enough to the paper to really focus on what I'm doing, which is why I do some of it off camera. I just need to get the paper up close. And also, I can't upload videos longer than 15 minutes, so I need to keep them short. And unfortunately, that means I have to leave out some of the steps and I have to make the video again shorter so I can upload it. I have made it twice the speed. So this is twice the speed I would be painting at. And in fact, this kettle took me three or four hours to paint. And some of the layers, I just went away and left them to dry naturally. Although this is a 140 pound paper, I found that it was still buckling even under the wide masking tape. And it made it difficult to paint when the paper buckled. I couldn't get a nice straight edge. I shouldn't be so lazy. I should tape the paper down properly so that I didn't get that buckling happening. And I also was using a rough cold press paper and I didn't like it for something like this. It wasn't suitable. I should have used just a regular cold press and it would have been a slightly smoother surface. The rough I think would be much better for bigger landscapes, not good for something detailed like this that needed nice sharp straight edges or curved edges as in the case of the spout here. And if you're doing your highlights and shadows on the spout, follow the curve of of the spout with your paintbrush and your paint. I have a really, really dark brown. I mix sepia with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And sometimes I put in a little bit of that permanent rose and some cadmium red in too. And I, I don't clean up my palette. I just mix my color on top of the other color that's there. That's absolutely fine. And I mix every time I go into my paintbrush Go for more paint, I mix a bit more colour in, I mix a bit more burnt sienna or a bit more sepia or a bit more blue. Change it up all the time, that's what makes your painting interesting, that's what makes your darks colourful and, and beautiful. The top of the spout was a much reddish, much lighter reddish brown than the bottom, so I've switched to that mix I have there for the top of the spout. And then as it came down, it got cooler and darker again. If you want to do a really good painting of a copper pot, go very slowly. Take your time. Do just little areas at a time. If you just want to work on a small area, that's fine. You can, you can wet the area around it so that you don't get hard lines unless you want them. And then you can come back and work on it later, as long as you've kept your paint wet enough that you don't have unplanned lines. Now, all of these tones look fairly dark, but these are the mid-tones, they're not the dark tones. And I'm lightening that one up a little bit. And everything dries much lighter once it's dry. You can see now I put on the cerulean blue and a little bit of hooker's green in the background and I've mixed up a really good cool dark color with the burnt sienna and the ultramarine and the Indian red 
and all the other colours that were there too, the, the cadmium red and the permanent rose. But see how dark this layer is. And it needs those other layers behind it so that it's even darker and so that some of the other beautiful warm tones shine through this dark layer. Otherwise it would be a very flat, very flat looking dark brown. But when you have the other colours shining through the transparent paint, that's what makes it interesting and lively. And putting on dark darks is what makes your lights look so bright and light. They will not shine and stand out as reflective lights unless you have good, strong, dark paint around them. I'm switching back and forth from some light reddish colours to some really cool, very dark browns. And not only does that help with the reflective quality of the pot, it also helps to make the pot look round, three-dimensional. It is completely round. So you need to show that by having dark as the pot goes away from you and much lighter as the pot comes towards you. A lot of things on the go here, not just creating the highlights and the reflections, but also making a sense of your pot looking round and three-dimensional. And if you really, really look at the reference photo, you can see so many different transitions from light to dark in the pot. And it really doesn't matter how many layers you do, you can keep on with the layers until it looks right. And underneath the pot, I used ultramarine blue and burnt sienna to later than this to put on a nice dark shadow under the pot. And I'm putting on the very fine detail. I have my number two brush and a lovely dark brown mixed with sepia, ultramarine blue, permanent rose and cadmium red. And wetting that in a little bit to make the little handle on the top of the pot look round as well. And I've had to move around to the side of the painting because, as I said, the tripod is right, right where I would like to sit. I haven't found a better place to put it so that I can film. These are my first attempts, so I'm not that great at filming yet. But I do think that is looking like reflective copper and a pretty shiny pot. Thank you for watching. I hope your painting turns out well.